Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Chappelle Space and Science Center for our Friday night virtual program. I am Lisa Hoover. I'll be your host this evening. And uh, we have a really exciting theme this month for studying bats. Our guest speaker tonight is James Wilson, naturalist at the East Bay Regional Park District. Hey, James, so good to see you. Thanks for coming back another month. Um, we're going to have a great lesson. He's going to tell us all about bats. And then we are going to have some Q&A. So by all means, put all of your questions in the chat there and uh, we'll answer as many as we can. And then uh, we'll have some announcements and then sit back, relax, and let us do the walking with our virtual hike. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to James. All right, great, thank you, Lisa. So let's begin. I'm gonna switch some things around and hopefully you can all see right now our big title bats. Lisa, can you give me a thumbs up if that's possible? Yeah, I think we're sharing screens. All right, thank you. So let's begin. Like Lisa said, my name is James Wilson and I am the supervising naturalist with the mobile education unit of the East Bay Regional Park District. And this evening, I've been honored by Chabot Space and Science Center to talk about one of my favorite subjects, bats. Let's begin. So a lot of you might be familiar with the park district. Um, we got over 121,000 acres, um, 73 regional parks, 31 regional trails, uh, 1,250 miles of trails within those parklands. We have 11 lakes and 40 fishing docks. Um, and 10 interpretive education centers. Um, all this is all situated on ancestral Ohlone land and I wanna pay respect for those native peoples who are the first ones here in California. So among all those places, we have some of these wonderful flying creatures. So let's kind of go into discovering what these things are and how they're a part of our ecosystem. So bats are mammals, just like us. Um, about 20% of all mammal species are bats. And there are over 1,400 um, 1, described species of bats out there in the world. Bats are more closely related to whales and pangolins than rodents, actually. A lot of people get that confused and think that they're flying rats, but they're really not. They're actually closer related to whales than they are even to those rodents. Um, and some of the individual bats can live up to 41 years old. And that was in captivity, I think um, somewhere in Europe. And there are um, our second most abundant mammal in the world, um, rodents being the first. Um, we classify bats in the order of a cry cryoptera, meaning winged hand in Latin. So unlike birds who fly kind of with their whole arm and feathers coming out of different parts of their arm, bats fly with their hands. Some wonderful illustrations of all kinds of bats of the world. Those are some big fruit bats. And a close relative, the whale. So like I was discussing, here's a great another drawing of bats with their skeletons. We see um, that hand as their wing. So um, cryptera meaning winged hand in Latin. So unlike birds, they're flying um, with their whole entire hands. Pretty amazing little feet. Um, a bat's wing kind of, if we were to look at it, if we were having bat's wings, let me say, um, we'd have that skin of the actual wing between our fingers. Um, and it stretches all the way from that little pinky finger, their fifth finger down to their knee. And um, you can imagine if we had fingers that were as long as our whole entire body, and um, this flexible skin membrane that goes all the way kind of from almost their shoulder all the way past their feet and to their tail um, is movable in a whole bunch of different joints and that makes the bat a real agile flyer. So bats are actually the only flying mammal. You might have heard of like another creature um, called a flying squirrel and they actually just glide. They don't actually fly. So they start up climbing a tree and they go all the way to the top of a tree and they have little skin flaps from their wrists down to their feet and they jump from the tree and they stretch out their arms, do it like this, 
stretch out their arms and then glide tree to tree, whereas a bat could take off and fly. Um, so that flexible skin and from bats is going from their pinky all the way down to their feet. And some of bats have a little bit of tail uh, skin too, going from their foot all the way to their tail and some don't. Um, but, you know, bats are amazing creatures. Um, Flying is pretty simple. If you think about it, it probably came about from dodging predators or catching prey. Um, there's even a bat in New Zealand called the lesser short-tailed bat that crawls around on the ground looking for prey. But one of the amazing things that I think about bats is echolocation. So I have um, some sounds for you. And these are bats uh, making these noises. They're coming from their mouth or their nose. And what they're doing is they're sending sound waves out and they're hoping that they're going to hit objects like their prey. And when they hit that object, it sends an echo back and it bounces off the object and comes back into their face usually and into their all those funny ridges that you might see on a bat's face and into their great big ears. And it makes it so bats can listen. Um, basically what they're doing is finding where their prey is. And about 70% of all bat species worldwide um, have this ability. And bats are the only animals um, are, excuse me, are not the only animals that use echolocation. If you can think of some other ones, um, maybe you have it in your mind. I'll give you a hint. It has to kind of do with the, some of their relatives. Yeah, whales. Whales are one of those um, that use echolocation. Same with dolphins and porpoises. There's a few birds that do it, but um, interesting enough, shrews do it. Um, and also a funny other little mammal called a tenric. So here, I'm gonna play some uh, bats singing, or not, excuse me, not singing, bats trying to find their prey using sound. bizarre, huh? Um, so, of course, we don't like hear this all every night and it kind of wakes us up at night. Um, most bats echolocation occurs beyond the range of even our human hearing. And humans can hear from about 20 uh, hertz to 15 to 20 um, kilohertz. And so depending on um, our age, actually, I think little kids can hear better. Um, bats calls range from nine kilohertz to um, 200 kilohertz. And so the way that we heard that is we use something called a bat detector. And I got one right here. Here's a nifty little bat detector. And it's got two dials, one for the volume and one to set the frequency. And here in my little scientific office, I do not have any bats flying around. I wish I did, but if we were out here maybe on a nice less smoky night, we can bring out the bat detector and wave it around into the sky. Right about this time is perfect time to see if we can hear some of those bats. So um, the squeaks and the squawks that we might hear that are coming out of the house, or if we know we have bats that are roosting, those are usually calls that um, adults make to their pups. And yeah, baby bats are called pups. Um, and they're, that's more of a communication talking back and forth. And that's the noise that we hear. But that other weird gurgly goo, that was something else that um, bats are using for echolocation. Some moths have even adapted to the calls. So if they hear the echolocation, they'll hear those funny noises that the bats are sending. The moths will either dive down lower and get closer to the ground to miss the bats. Or if they hear it and they feel it onto their bodies, they'll all of a sudden start to wiggle around so that they can get away from them. Um, it's, um, I think you can give it's the, um, the context of the game Marco Polo, if anyone's ever played that, where you might be in the swimming pool and someone has their eyes closed and they say, Marco! And then their friends are trying to swim around, they go, Polo! So the Polo is the echo going back. And poor Marco's out there trying to find Polo. And as it gets closer and closer, it gets louder and louder. And that's kind of how echolocation works. Got something in the chat. Let me see if I need to, yeah. Ooh, good question. Where are the back, uh, 
bat detectors purchased. Um, the good old internet. I think that's the easiest way. Um, we get them from a couple different research organizations. Um, and I'll talk about how we do our research and how we find species of bats. But um, our bat detector, I can do a little advertising, is the Peterson Ultrasonic Detector D100. That's the one that we're liking to use lately. So bats are also just general amazing creatures. Um, without a doubt, we owe a lot to bats. Um, without bats, we could say goodbye to mangoes, bananas, even avocados, guavas. Bats are pollinating these plants that then will turn into fruit once pollinated. So the bats at night are actually sipping the nectar from these plants and pollinating the flowers. Um, and then making all this wonderful fruit that we enjoy. So there's over 300 species of fruit dependent bats. Um, and bats also help spread seeds too, like from figs and cacao, which we actually get chocolate from. So you can say without bats, we probably wouldn't even have chocolate. Um, we also like bats because they pollinate plants like um, agave is one of those. And then they also uh, pollinate the seeds from our iconic saguaro cactus. Here's a great photograph, saguaro cactus and those wonderful flowers that it has. They're huge. And you know what? They're kind of adapted for big old bat heads to go floating in there too, so that they could get pollinated. Yeah, amazing pollinators. So they're going to all kinds of different flowers. Um, a lot of the bats that we have around here in the East Bay are mainly eating insects, which is also a good thing if you don't get like mosquitoes. So I'll jump right into it and talk about some of the bats of the East Bay. So we have a great crew. Believe it or not, it is the Bat Brigade. They're logging over 100,000 hours, and that's over 16,000 volunteers. And they've been working with the Park District for quite some time. Um, the Bat Brigade has found eight different species of bats in the East Bay, um, right here in our East Bay Regional Parks. But there's over 15 known species here in the East Bay. And bats were um, present in 10 East Bay Regional Park Districts. Um, that we know of, and those are where we do our little census and we start to study them. So I'm gonna go into all those wonderful different species and some of them you might find familiar. And some of them are actually species of special concern as well. I can talk about that. So here we go, our first bat. This is the pallid bat. They're one of those species of special concern. So population numbers are low and um, throughout California, and so we're keeping close monitor of them throughout the state and they're actually protected because of this. So they have large wings, they're about 15 inches. Um, they're light color, kind of blonde tan fur. They have cut funny little pig-like snouts. Um, and they've also been known to have a skunk-like odor, believe it or not, um, if you smell a bunch of them all at the same time. They like dry habitats and rocky areas. Um, and they're coming out usually about 30 to 60 minutes after sunset. So right about now, if you lived over in one of those places that you have that kind of habitat. Um, they forage um, on open ground and they um, do big dips and swooshes. Um, they've also been known to catch insects off the ground like scorpions and um, let's see, we have praying mantises that are crawling around and millipedes, all kinds of things. Um, and also spiders as well. Um, they're pretty social. They like to live in groups of at least 20 and they hibernate in the winter and they're very sensitive to disturbances. So movements of their homes, maybe even the smoke that we like we have outside. So the next species I'd like to talk about is our Brazilian or Mexican free-tailed bat. So free-tailed um, extend, um, what the free tail means is that their tail extends beyond that flap, that tail membrane. Um, they're mostly insectivores, meaning they are eating all those insects um, we have one species of these recorded in the East Bay. Um, they're small groups, um, usually of males, and they have larger maturity colonies, and you can find them between the coast and the Central Valley. And um, populations have also been known to hibernate, too. Some parks that you can find these at are Ardenwood Historic Farm, Anthony Chabot, and um, out at Camp Arroyo near Knoll. So, are bats good pollinators? Yeah. Great question. But most bats um, are gonna be eating insects. So um, a lot of things out there. Ooh, I got another fun question. Why do bats have beards? 
Well, they got all kinds of interesting hair. Um, we're going to see a, a really beautiful in a little bit. Um, but yeah, we can talk about the hair in a second. But let me um, get back to this big brown bat that we got here. So they're medium. They got a wingspan that's about 13 to 15 inches. Um, and they have black ears. Um, and their ears are a little rounded. And these ones are the ones that we'll probably find common near kind of human structures. And they're emerging at dusk. Um, feeding on all kinds of things, uh, mainly uh, insects and also beetles. Um, they also hibernate in the winter. Um, they're more tolerant of humans. And one place that you can find these is up at Redwood Regional Park and also in Colcane. So right near Chabot Space and Science Center. Um, these ones and a lot of the bats that we can talk about um, have different kinds of flight patterns. So when they're coming out and they're flying around looking for food, some of them fly differently. So um, our Big brown bat here flies slow and straight and steady. So if you see one of these kind of in that dusk, they're gonna be flying slow and straight and steady. Talking about beards, look at this one. This is a funny bat. Um, so here's our little canyon bat and they're the smallest bat in North America. And they have a wingspan seven to nine inches. Um, it's kind of hard to see in this photo on the right, but down at the bottom left, you can actually see the screw head of a screw into that wood. Um, so the bat's head is about the size of a penny, pretty small. Um, they're similar to our little California brown bat or our California myotis, um, but they have a, a different shape tragress, which is this uh, club shape near their ears. Um, there can be found in the desert, uh, grassland, brushland, woodlands, rocky canopies, cliffs, outcroppings. They're coming out about 45 minutes before sunset. So they're out there and you definitely can see them flying around. Um, these ones are slow and fluttery. So they're kind of um, going very slow, flapping their wings, but going very slow. And they're super sensitive to wind. So if wind comes up, then they usually kind of fly around and follow the wind. And what they're looking for is swarming insects like caddisflies and stoneflies, um, small beetles. So, um, hopefully, knock on wood, if anybody's been following the weather, we have some rain predicted, hopefully for next week. Um, and we might get a big termite blossom and hopefully the bats will be out munching away. So um, another little fun bat that we have, one of my favorites, is the Townsend's big eared bat. So uh, this is another species of special concern and uh, about medium size, 12 to 13 inch wingspan. Um, and they got huge ears. Look at those wonderful ears. They're over an inch long. And sometimes they can even be coiled up, which I think is really interesting. Um, and they got that big lump on the snap too. They got some fun nose kind of things going on. Um, they're foraging along streams, along forest edges, and they're slow, but they're also very maneuverable. So they're listening and using echolocation. And once they hear something, they go for it. And they're catching all their prey in flight. Um, which is pretty exciting if you ever get the chance to see them flying around and eating stuff. Um, but they're also super sensitive to human disturbances. Um, and they might even like abandon a roost if one of their places gets lost, say if a tree gets cut down or something, um, and go and find new houses. Um, one of the places that we found these bats are out in Sonol. Um, ooh, I got, I'm getting some good questions. So let me go back to beards. Um, yeah, bats got to keep themselves warm. So that's part of their uh, way of keeping warm is they have all this kind of fuzz around them. But they also use kind of their hair to catch sound too, helping with that echolocation. So that's part of the hair maybe around the face and maybe the beard that might be part of it. Um, do all bats hibernate? No. So um, not all bats hibernate. I'm not sure how many in our 14,000 bats that we got out there hibernate. But, you know, some of them in California do and some don't. And bats also migrate, which is interesting. So they might be coming from someplace in another part of the country, like South America, and then coming all the way up to the North America. Um, let's see, I got a, some other wonderful questions that I'm gonna try to answer and then we'll move on. Ooh, will bats bite you? Yes, I'll talk about that in a little bit. I, that's a great one. And I will get to that when we talk about what happens with bats and humans. Oh my goodness, these are amazing questions. Okay, I'm gonna continue on and then hopefully I can answer some of these in a little bit. So another one of my favorite species, and I've seen these out in Tilden Regional Park, is the hoary bat. And so they're pretty long, large wingspan, excuse me, uh, 13 to 16 inches, and they have thick 
um, very thick hair and it's frosted. If you look at this one, it's kind of orange around its neck, but then it has these wonderful kind of white highlights. Um, and they're often found in woodland and forest habitats. Um, males are typically found in California in the foothills and the mountains, and the females are found in the lowlands and coastal valleys, and they're migrating as well. This is one of the migrating bats. Um, they fly straight and, and fast um, while foraging. Um, I think this bat's been known to go up to like 35 miles an hour. Um, let's see, other fun things about this bat. Um, they love to eat moths, uh, true bugs, uh, mosquitoes, and all kinds of other insects. And one of the other interesting things is they're often solitary. So if it isn't breeding season, they're often found by themselves. Um, and they like to roost in trees that have like dense foliage. So maybe like a eucalyptus or a redwood tree. And I think these are gonna be our last two bats that we got here in the East Bay. Um, we have our California mitos and, um, oh, I took the title out. Uh, this is the Yuba mitos. Um, so two little uh, bats that we have, um, they have little nine inch wingspans, um, probably our most common bat that we have around. Um, oftentimes these are called the little brown bat. Um, so their uh, wing flap goes extending from their ankle all the way down kind of to their knee and back around. So this is uh, hardly see the little tip of their tail sticking out. Um, these are often come out shortly right after sunset and they uh, peak. So most of them are all out about one hour after sunset and they're slow and erratic too. So they're kind of flittering around, just looking for things and catching stuff using their echolocation. Um, often along the, like the margins of a forest or trees are, um, I think Anthony Chabot is a great place to see these um, along the eucalyptus forest and they're eating mostly moths and flies. So here's some great kind of stats on the bats that we have here in the East Bay. Um, this study was from 2004 to 2019, and we actually in 2020 got to continue on this study, but um, it's kind of hard to see in a lot of numbers and all those kinds of things, but we found the most bats out in Del Val, it's to be expected, wonderful rock outcroppings, and you have the lakes there and all kinds of things. But between that time, they found 401 mouse-eared bats, so those mitotis species that we were just talking about. Um, in other places that you can find bats, Sonol Regional Wilderness, Ardenwood, Anthony Chabot, Black Diamond Mines, Redwood Regional Park, Reinhardt Redwood Regional Park, excuse me, Sibley, uh, Coal Canyon, Tilden, uh, there's that one little hoary bat, and uh, Camp Arroyo. And these are kind of the numbers by bat species in the park district. So we got a lot of those mitotis, mouse-eared bats, and then the pallid bats, and then the Brazilian or Mexican free-tailed bats, kind of going down the list of all the different ones that are there. So why all the stigma? Why is all this kind of scary stuff around bats, right? Well, things can be scary out at night, it's true. A lot of American and European-centric pop culture kind of like to victimize the bat. Um, you know, if you've ever heard of Dracula and all of those kinds of creatures and stories, um, often got, bats get a bad rap. Um, oftentimes, whenever we see a bat um, during the day, it's often when they're sick. And so we might also have that stigma too of, oh no, a sick bat, we can't, we got to watch out for it. And a lot of the times, and I, and I made sure to edit this when you're going through my slideshow, that um, we see photos of bats when they're in defense position. So they have their mouth like open and they're snarling because someone's holding them and they're trying to get away. And so they're acting in defense. And that's often when we see all those sharp teeth and things like that. So if we all just see pictures of that, then we think bats are really vicious. Um, so, but in reality, there's usually only one or two humans that get rabies um, each year from bats. And it's, rabies is, uh, we can talk about that in a little bit, but um, it's often caused by humans picking up bats with their bare hands. And most of these bites happen from bats that are trapped inside of homes. So not even bats from outside. I think within that uh, range from 1997 to 2006, there was only one person who was ever bitten outside. It was because they were opening their car door and the bat got trapped against the glass and then bit the person. So, you know, we don't have a lot of, to fear from bats. However, getting into kind of some harder science, um, there's some things going around. A lot of you have probably heard about it, the coronavirus, um, but it's a, a zoonotic zoonotoic virus, um, the same thing as SARS, 
Um, and I can explain that there's several coronaviruses out there um, and they're known to cause respiratory infections ranging from the common cold to more severe diseases. Um, some of you might've heard of uh, what we call MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome and the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, SARS. So those were from bats to camels to humans or from bats to um, a funny little kind of cat-like creature to humans. And uh, most, most recently we discovered what we're calling SARS COVID-19. Um, the virus mutates and it might even have taken um, a segment of a different creature we don't know and we're still trying to figure this out, um, how it got transmitted to us, but all it really took was being in contact with that and then, you know, rubbing your face or rubbing your nose or not washing your hands and that's how it kind of all started and got passed to humans. And that's kind of where we are at now. Um, so some interesting research, um, I can copy these and paste them into the chat at some point. But I encourage all of our adult readers out there that if you want some scientific background to read um, this one report from Emerging Infectious Disease um, that came out in 2006. They had a review of bats and SARS and how these things are passed. And then just in 2013, we have one of the uh, ancient origins of the coronavirus because our little bats have been dealing with this for thousands of years. And then recently, the New Yorker came out with a wonderful article from Bats to Human Lungs, the Evolution of Coronavirus. So some interesting reading if you ever want to kind of get some of the natural history on what's going on with all of us nowadays. But I also want to explore some of the other wonderful things about bats. Um, we're talking about bad raps and things like that. But um, bats are thought of around the world in different ways. So in, let me get to my next photo. There we go wonderful Chinese astronomy. Um, some of you might be familiar with this and we might have talked about this at Chabot Space and Science Center, but um, in the Chinese astron astronomy, excuse me, um, there was broken apart into these four sections. Um, so these four houses and uh, the black tortoise house, which is in the north, um, was comprised of what the Chinese zodiac has 28 days. And number 10 actually is represented by the bat. And in Chinese culture, the bats often symbolize um, double happiness. Um, there's, if you see five bats, that's called the five blessings of life. So that's health, wealth, virtue, long life, and uh, peaceful death. And um, sometimes we see bats with peaches. You might have seen a photograph of, or not a photograph, a wonderful ink illustration of that. And that's also a, another symbol of long life. Um, if we see um, red bats, for example, um, I think I have a, there we go. There's some red bats. Um, this is a wish for great happiness. So if this gift was given to you, this is a wonderful little uh, bottom of a teacup um, with these red bats. This was the wish for happiness. Um, some other interesting things in different cultures. In uh, Mayan astrology, um, the Milky Way was a sacred symbol as a creator of all things and the path of the dead. And it divided the zodiac belt in half. Um, and the constellation of the bat was the most mystical for the Mayans and represented the entrance to the underworld. And here's a wonderful fun photo. This is a little some current astrology. Here we go. This is a bat nebula. So kind of recently kind of the photo was adjusted with bat nebula. Um, we see some really cool colors in here. You might see the bat face and the wings, why it's called the bat nebula. Um, apparently this whole thing is about the size of the moon um, and it's about 12 light years away. Um, or excuse me, uh, 1,400 light years from our Earth. Um, and the colors have been adjusted to see different elements. So we're seeing hydrogen and oxygen, blue and the red. And so I kind of wanted to end on kind of a, a happier note and make us think about bats out there in the world. You know, oftentimes they get a bad rap, but um, I have two poems that I'd like to end with. Um, this one is from the Sandoke, from um, a poet, eighth century a Zen poet, uh, Shito Izan. And um, the title uh, Sandoke is The Merging of Differences and Equality. And so I'll, I'll read it really quick. And then I have another poem. So within light, there's darkness, but do, do not try to understand the darkness. Within darkness, there is light, but do not look for that light. Light and darkness are a pair, like the foot before, the foot behind in walking. Each thing has its own intrinsic value and is related to everything else in function and position.
So some kind of deep Zen wisdom there. And one of my other favorite poets kind of summed it up really in a good way. And I think for those children watching, we'll understand this one. The great poet, Shel Silverstein. The baby bat screamed out in fright, turn on the dark, I'm afraid of the light. So bats are a wonderful creature that we have here in our ecosystem. We love bats for all kinds of different reasons, for pollinating fruit, for eating insects, for just being bats. Um, our close, well, not so close, but distant, distant relative in the mammal family, um, just another amazing part of this world. And I hope you all have a chance to go out there and appreciate bats. Hopefully when the smoke clears, um, go out in those times that I said, keep an eye open and you'll see them flying around, often really quiet, unless you get your bat detector and point it at them. But um, yeah, definitely take a look out there and see if you can find some things and come out in, into the regional parks during those times and look for them too in some of those parks that I mentioned. So at this point, I'd also like to kind of go back through the chat and answer some questions. So I'm going to scroll on up and see where I left off. Oh, such wonderful stuff. Okay, here we go. Will bats bite? Oh, only if you pick them up. Um, and so what's happening out there is people are often getting bit by bats by trying to pick them up. Um, here's some tips. If you have a bat stuck in your house, find your parent, find an adult. Um, you're not going to want to touch that bat. And there's a couple different ways you can do that. You can keep them either in a bucket or in, um, wrapped in a towel. Um, definitely want to be wearing gloves and you do not want to touch the bat to get it out of your house. If the bat is flying around, don't try to catch it. Just open up your doors and open up your windows. Um, sit in another room and wait and enjoy and um, hopefully the bat will fly out. It's, it'll be a good story for the rest of the family. Um, so that's oftentimes when you get bitten, it's because you're inside and you're trying to pick them up. So try not to do that. Um, what's the best bat, best bat box to build for your yard? Ooh, good question. Um, best bat box to build. Um, a couple different models out there and different kinds of plans. Um, you can Google California bat boxes and that's probably the best way to come up with it. Um, and definitely follow instructions. So there's definitely a bat size and it's very narrow. You wouldn't think it, but bats can squeeze into tiny little gaps. So if you think that's too narrow, believe it or not, um, it is not. And that you should keep that little narrow gap. I've oftentimes seen people like Eagle Scouts build bat boxes and think they need more room, but actually bats like that tiny little space. Um, plywood's a good thing to use, but try not to use pressure treated plywood because uh, there's chemicals in there. Um, yeah, I would definitely look it up and see what kinds of models are out there on the internet. Ooh, newest species of bat that's been discovered. Oh, I wish I knew that. I do not. Um, that's another th wonderful thing to use that powerful internet for. Ooh, what kind of bats live under Highway 80 near the Weir near Sacramento? Ooh, my guess is probably big brown bat. Um, that one species we saw and also some of those mitotis um, so the little brown bat or the California mitotis um, who can live together. So those are the, probably the ones. But what's neat about um, the bat surveys that we do, um, we're identifying bats with the bat detector. And that's something you can do. You can figure out what frequency, what species of bats are talking to each other and also what their sounds are. And you can identify them that way. You can also identify them by the way they fly. And I described a couple different ways on how different species fly. And that's one way you can ID them out. I don't know exactly which ones are near Sacramento. Ooh, are there bat count activities that we can participate in? Yeah, um, so if you go to evparks.org and you go to the stewardship section, and we have some wonderful wildlife biologists that have um, some research studies going on and they always need kind of help and things like that. And um, Doc Quack is one of our biologists and he's leading up our volunteer program and get can get folks trained up on how to do the bat count activities? Good question. How long and high can bats fly? Ooh, ooh, I don't know that one either. Um, they're gonna be out pretty much all night, probably taking some breaks and coming back early in the morning. How high they can fly is a great question that I don't know. One interesting fact about that though is that we can find bats on pretty much every single continent except for Antarctica. So they're all around the world. So they're getting around. Is there a bat house near Chabot? I don't know, but they need one. I'll have to talk with Jessica and 
maybe we can get one there. I've heard that you can see them from the observation deck, though. Oh, bat house potentially attract bats to your attic. Well, if you have uh, holes leading to your attic, um, yes, I could see that it could get bats attracted to your attic. Um, so you want to make sure that you have uh, your attic kind of sealed up, or at least you have screen on that. Um, and how long do bats sleep? Um, about the day. That's a good question, too. So do bats carry rabies? Um, yes, they can carry rabies. Ah, is the Brazilian free-tailed bat from Brazil. Um, you might have heard me switching the name back and forth between Mexican free-tailed and Brazilian free-tailed. I believe the range of the bat, it goes all the way down towards Brazil, but I think the species that we have that are kind of up towards California are mainly migrating maybe from Mexico back and forth. Yeah, so good question. Ooh, why do bats have fingers attached to their wings? Oh, crazy. Well, their wings are their fingers and their fingers are their wings. So that wing is actually right here and they have the flaps of skin in between all their fingers all the way down to their ankles. And those long, long fingers, if you imagine if my had a bat finger, my finger would be about the length of my body and I'm about six feet long. Ooh. So big giant wings and those are their fingers. Ooh, how fast do bats fly? You know, I think it was that one bat, I, the long-eared bat, or, ooh, I can't remember. It could fly up to 35 miles an hour. So they could fly pretty fast. Best way to attract bats. Hmm, having some bat habitat's always good. Open spaces like our regional parks are good places for bats. Um, let's see. Um, another ways to attract bats is having a bat house. Um, not a lot of places for bats to roost nowadays because um, we have less trees and less kinds of structures like that, maybe less old barns that maybe the big brown bat can hang out in. So building a bat box is a good way to attract bats to your house. And they're wonderful ways to get rid of mosquitoes and things like that. <laughs> so what kind of bat is Batman? I'm happy somebody brought Batman up. Ooh, you know, Batman. You know, Batman's based off of a lot of different things. But just recently, um, there was an interesting interpretation of Batman through the, the Mayan legend that I was discussing about bats, the bat constellation in the Mayan tradition uh, as the entrance to the underworld. Um, and an artist in Mexico made this wonderful rendition of the Batman suit with the kind of the motif of the Mayan um, deity. So if you Google Mayan, Mayan and Batman, you'll come up with a really interesting kind of sculpture of the Batman costume. So maybe that's where Batman was based off of, but um, I'm not sure what kind of bat bit Batman to make him Batman though. Um, how smart are bats? Well, you know, smartness is one of those things that us humans like to kind of rank different things on. Um, I mean, if you can echolocate, I think you're pretty smart. So I would say that. Uh, bat box websites. Um, yeah, California bat boxes. So that's what I would put in your search engine and you'll come up with some different ones. You can even put in California bat box plans and you'll come up with some wonderful projects out there. Oh, why do they hang upside down? Um, because they don't have chairs. Usually in those places where they're roosting, they're hanging upside down because um, they don't have a floor. And that's a great way to get away from predators too. Um, so caves, uh, barns, eaves of buildings, um, inside of tree bark, that hoary bat sometimes will nest inside of the, the bark of a tree, like eucalyptus trees, and that's a great way to be away from predators. Um, how do bats reproduce? Um, just like most other mammals. Um, so yeah, has anyone made friends with a bat? Whew, that's a great question. You know, there's different places where us humans can be friendlier to bats and bats will come out more. Um, wonderful places like in Texas and a few other bridges where they are actually encouraging bats to roost. Um, I know in England, I think it's even Sir David Attenborough, knows of a couple different places. I've seen some wonderful nature documentaries of some bridges and water where they've um, created bat habitat for the bats to roost. And um, that at night, you can go and sit next to that creek and see the places where the bats are coming out and where the bats are roosting. Let's see, do we have any other questions? I don't think so. Wonderful friend Eric's helping me with the searches because we're going from Facebook to Zoom. 
using every technology we can. Let me go back up. Ooh, the blood drinking bats. Yes, the vampire bats. Um, there are vampire bats, um, bats that will bite um, mammals and drink their blood. Um, interesting enough, they're found in kind of South America region into Central America. And the vampire bat, um, what do you call it? Nostalgia and folklore from the Northern European traditions um, really didn't involve the bat, so to say, until these bats in Central America were discovered like in the 1800s. And that's when we kind of associated, put the vampire bat with the vampires that we know in the folklore and stories together. Um, yeah. Let's see. Any bat viewing tips? Ooh, good one. So, you know, um, this is probably one of the best things um, because this will make you have actually see a lot more bats than you would think. But to find a place that has an edge, if you notice some of the habitats that I'm describing are what we call ecotones. So they're the in-between between two habitats. So whether it's in between a lake and the edge of the lake or a meadow and then the edge of a forest, these are great places to see bats. Um, so trying to find those combinations of habitats, um, if you're farther in Eastern, Eastern Contra Costa County, um, you know, a lot of open grassland, but any place that you can find an oak forest next to you. If you're out on the western side of the East Bay, say Redwood Regional Park, um, you're not going to find them right in the deep redwood trees, but places where maybe a meadow's near. Um, I'm thinking of near the Trudeau Center, um, which is up off of uh, Skyline Boulevard near Skyline Host, uh, High School, has a nice open lawn that's on the edge of a forest. That might be a good place in the evening to see bats. Um, down near the shoreline, probably not a good chance. Um, I believe like Temescal would probably be a good place right around dusk. Um, also Tilden Regional Park has a lot of nice big grass meadows and those are also good places. Um, let's see, we're getting some other good questions in now. Um, oh, somebody is talking about the moon hoax of 1835. Yeah, so back in 1835, it was actually reported to be the first fake news. We're talking about a lot of fake news nowadays. Um, anybody can Google it out. The moon hoax of 1835 was a report that there were bat people that lived on the moon. So, um, and a lot of people believed it. Um, and it got circulated all over the globe that there were all these bat people and bipedal beavers and unicorns and everything living on the moon. And the scientists who wrote it actually had to say eventually that it was a hoax. So that's another thing to look up on the internet. Great question. Ooh, how big can bats get? Some fruit bats are big, almost as big as a fox. Um, so yeah, we're finding those in places like um, Southeast Asia and into India. Can bats swim? Mm, good question, I don't know. If bats can actually swim, swim. I bet they could probably take off off the water. A lot of bats feed off of the water and a lot of bats dip into the water and eat insects off the water. So that's a great question. How far can bats call? Ooh, that's another great one. You know, what's neat about using uh, echolocation and frequencies is that these sounds can travel really far. And um, so I don't know the exact distance and it's probably different for every bat. And do bats migrate? Yes, they are definitely migrating. Um, you know, mainly just like birds move in north to south, depending on the weather. Yeah, so that's a good question. Any other questions out there? Well, I also, whoop, we got one, huh? What do you call a group of bats? Hmm, I don't know. That's another good question. Why are you all stumping me tonight? I'd like to call them a flock, but I don't think that's the exact term. Do they make good pets? No, absolutely not. <laughs> I wouldn't have a bat as a pet, but we do have a bat rescues throughout the East Bay. Lindsay Wildlife Museum makes an effort to um, help rehome bats and get them back out in the wild if they're captured or hurt. Um, so people do take care of bats, but it is definitely not advised to have a bat as a pet. They do not make good pets. How hot or cold do they get? Well, with all that wonderful little tight fur, they, um, they can keep pretty warm. 
Um, cooling off is a whole other thing. Um, that's the nice thing about having kind of just skin for uh, arms, right? In hands, um, I have no, I have seen bats who are hot, kind of expanding their wings and kind of like airing themselves out. Especially if you're inciting inside of siding, which is the stuff that's on the side of a house. If you're in that little crack on the sunny side, you get hot pretty quick. So they're able to regulate um, their temperature pretty well. Um, are they solitary or social animals? Um, it depends on the species. The little hoary bat is usually solitary, whereas um, that first bat we were talking about and like the big brown bats are definitely social. Ooh, when's the best season to see bats in the East Bay? You know, it's right about now, kind of late into summer. Um, once we pass the, um, once we pass the equinox, seems to be a good time. Um, bats are getting ready to, you know, wait for that first big insect bloom that we get with termites and a few other things. Um, yeah, so usually this is probably the best time to see them. How are they related to whales? Well, you know, all of us mammals are all related in some way or another. So if you go down our evolutionary chain, you can kind of meet up where bats and whales bridged off kind of together. It was a funny little creature, kind of like a, um, um, a little shrew was the bat, and rel the bat and whale relative. Bats in San Leandro. Yeah, I'm sure there's bats in San Leandro. I bet there's bats probably in most every town in the East Bay if you look in the right places. Ooh, yeah, I just stirred them up after the big thunderstorms. Yeah, you know, one thing I was trying to do research on was how the smoke affects bats and also weather and things like this. Um, you know, I, a lot of animals were kind of upset during thunderstorms and I wouldn't be surprised if the bats were too. So yeah, that might be, that's a good question. Well, I do wanna say thank you to the Chabot Space and Science Center for the opportunity to talk about these little creatures. Um, they hold uh, true to my heart. Um, I love bats. Ironically, my mother's maiden name is Bat. Um, so I am a bat, so to say, in some ways and proud of it. And um, I just want you all to go out there and explore. Um, these are some great times to see these little mammals flying around and it's a wonderful way to kind of see something amazing in this world. And um, I encourage you all to Maybe even go out and get a bat detector so you can hear them talking and trying to find their food too, which is pretty exciting as well. So thank you Chabot Space and Science Center and um, have a fun hike. And I hope to see you out there and um, enjoy. Thanks so much, James. We learned a lot. Um, if you all learned something new tonight, give us some thumbs up in the chat there. Let's give James some appreciation. That well, was a really <laughs> fascinating uh, presentation. Um, couple of quick announcements about up and coming events before we go to our virtual hike. Every Wednesday at 10.30 a.m. we have live science, you don't wanna miss it, right here on Facebook Live, 10.30 a.m. free of charge every week. Uh, we have our live viewing every weekend, uh, virtual telescope viewing, um, the season is changing, so there's something new to look at. Um, come check out our astronomers. At the end of the month, um, it's Halloween on Friday, October 30th. We're gonna have a live variety hour. You don't wanna miss it. There will be demonstrations. There will be science activities. There will be candy making, uh, cocktails, something for everyone. So uh, Friday, October 30th, be there or be, it's gonna be a fantastic time. Um, Eric, anything on your, your list for up and coming events? Um, not yet. Things are coming maybe in, uh, hopefully in December, but I did want to just uh, shout out to all the members that, um, were out there that tuned in. Um, it's been a while since I've, I've, uh, interacted with you guys on, a, on an event, but I'm uh, excited to do more and see you all out there. Thanks for, uh, tuning in. One more announcement, uh, Eric and I are wearing our Chabot uh, wardrobe here. I'm wearing the uh, Visit Oakland, uh, sorry, um, Chabot shirt here that glows in the dark. And uh, you can get yours uh, 
So uh, just ask us about it and we'll provide all the details. Um, so if there's no other questions, we're going to skip ahead to our virtual hike. And we're sorry it's not uh, as much as we would like because uh, we still have smoky conditions, but um, we have something. So stay tuned.
Thank you all for coming. That's our program this evening. I hope you had a blast. I know I did and learned a lot. We'll see you next time. Good night.